All right, great. Okay, cool. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Academy of Animated Arts interview series. We're talking to the great Matt Wilson. Uh, Matt Wilson and I have worked together for a very long time. Um, Matt has, is now a lead lighting artist at Blue Sky Studios. Before that, he was a, you were a CG, a creative director, a CG creative director at Charlotte's, correct? That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Matt has done an incredible amount of work that I've seen him do. He's done, he's been our sky lead. He created all the skies for multiple Blue Sky movies. He's done comp amazing compositing work, amazing lighting work, and he's an all around incredible artist. And we are very lucky to talk to him today. And Matt, I don't know if you remember this, but we, you, you and I, uh, you worked on like my very first thing at Blue Sky, which was the 20th Century Fox entry, the, the, um, what the drum roll the logo? Fanfare, thing. yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I was a, I, I didn't, I didn't do anything visual on it. I was a render wrangler. <laughs> you did like, you did the skies on that, and you did everything on that, and that yeah. was incredible stuff. I, it's funny, like I see that pop up every once in a while, and I forget that we had done that. It's, yeah, it's crazy that well, we were so render wrangling. <laughs> we did it like at eight k or something crazy. Oh yeah, we yeah. Want it to last forever. <laughs> yeah. And then they changed the name of the company. <laughs> like like immediately stuff. afterwards. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Matt. We really Thanks for having it. me here. Yeah. So the first thing that I always like to ask everybody whenever we're interviewing them, because we have our students and we have um, uh, a lot of people who are looking to break into the industry. So I always just want to hear your story. Like, where did you come from? How did you get into VFX and lighting? And like, what's, tell me your come up story. So it's funny, you, um, you, you kind of gave me a heads up that you were going to ask that question tonight, and it kind of brought back some memories. And I remember my entry into the industry kind of started back when I was in high school. Um, I was wildly obsessed with Twister, <laughs> and I thought it was like the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And Wait, some reason, Helen Hunt? It, yeah, yeah, with Helen Hunt. I, it's, it, it just blew my mind that we were capable of creating such complex scenes. Um, so I really started kind of like diving into computer graphics and I, I had had a little bit of experience with it going back to, I guess, grade school. Um, and I think actually some of the first versions of RenderMan possibly. Uh, but anyway, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm in school in Buffalo and they really don't have many computers and they don't really have any software. So um, the, they kind of started to expand our department and that um, inspired me to reach out to a company called Electric Image um and see if they would donate some of their software which at the time was being used for i think um some of the star trek stuff wow. so i, I kind of like dove off the deep end into that program and started trying to like come up with animation um and ended up joining a bunch of user groups and just kind of like sharing my work around and got really involved in doing like some small commercial projects nice um and at the time my my uncle was involved in ringling and my cousin was uh going there for i think one of the first few computer animation classes that was there so i started talking with him and sharing my story and sort of what i wanted to do and um got kind of hooked up with some of the students at ringling as well and that kind of got me further into sort of dialing my focus into where i wanted to go um, so I went to Ringling for uh, a number of years and then um, had done some freelance work here and there while I was in school. Um, actually ended up doing some work on uh, some Rogue Spear video games for a couple of summers, my sophomore and junior year when I was there. Um, and that was cool because that was kind of like my first foray into real-time graphics, but also kind of into like a professional setting. So I was really sort of chomping at the bit when school ended. Um, when I left, I went to Chicago and I started working with a bunch of, um, actually that's not true, that's totally out of order. First I went to Atlanta and when I was in Atlanta, then I met the guys from Fathom. And that's, if you know at the office, that's Eldar, that's yeah. Angel, that's Gina, um, it's Harold, it was John Davis. There's, there were a lot of us that were there. Um, Jeff Gabor, one of our mm -hmm. star animators. So that was my first real like film if you can call it that, the mm. production crew. And that was and, Delgo, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, Delgo, yeah. <laughs> um, so while, that was like my first film experience and I was there working on lighting and doing layout and some effects work, kind of doing the generalist routine. Um, and while I was there, uh, I had an opportunity to move to Chicago. So I was kind of doing both at the same time. Got involved in the commercial world. So this is kind of where my fork happened. I started doing um, Delgo and started doing some film stuff. Uh, and then I started doing commercial work with DK. That kind of got me into the, the the friendship and partnership with Vince and um, Ryan, who were my partners when I started up Vitamin um, mm -hmm. in Chicago. And that team 
coincidentally it became the team at Charlex when I went back, <laughs> which is part of the reason why I left Blue Sky to come back to Charlex. So it's my, a very small my, industry. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean it's it's amazing the cycles. I mean the fact that I'm still working with like some of the Fathom guys mm -hmm. 15, 20 years later is pretty crazy. And Ryan Dunn, who is still the ECD at Charlex, is still like one of my best friends. It's like it's 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 an interesting loop that it's gone through. But I think that if I look back through all of it, I think I knew immediately that lighting and compositing was sort of my focus. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that being a strong generalist was a, a good way to understand the best way to um, not be as frustrated with the software as I think a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the hardest things is dealing with the, the frustrations and the fact that we are artists working in a technical industry. Um, and I think lighting specifically for me really felt more painterly. Yeah. Um, and actually that's, that's another part of my, my, my career. When I was in Atlanta, before I was working on Delgo, I was working as a professional oil painter and doing portraits and selling pieces in galleries. And that was, I, I had actually taken a stint where I didn't really want to do computer graphics anymore at all. Yeah. We all go through those every once in a while. But yeah, I think definitely. <laughs> you still paint? Um, I still try to paint. Um, it's, it's difficult now because our schedules have been so crazy. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the reason why I was so happy to uh, come back and join the family at Blue Sky was um, to try to make some more air gaps in my days to give me more time to paint and do those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So you've been, um, so I want to talk a little bit about your time at uh, Charlix a little yeah. bit. So, well, one of the things that I just learned about you the other day was that you are the voice of the Cinnamon Toast Crunch guys in the commercial that you were the CG, uh, the computer, the, the, yeah. the, yeah. Just tell me about how that happened. How, like, just talk, talk uh, me through that project. How does that happen? And, and talk about okay. the rules of it. If you haven't seen Matt's reel, how beautiful and they're glorious. And I just want to hear your story on that. Sure, sure. So, I mean, we, we, were, we were pitching on a, um, a kind of an open-ended job that came in. And every once in a while, you get something from an agency where they come to you as storytellers. And they're like, look, this is what we're doing. Help us come up with a narrative. Help us redefine the character. These are the characteristics that we want them to have. This is where we're going with the campaign. Just give us some ideas. So we um, did an open pitch for it and uh, did this really cool like coffee scene, like a, um, a coffee shop scene. And it was a stop mo background with CG characters. And it was, it was short and sweet and to the point. And of course, anytime you do anything like that, you have to have scratch audio. Yeah. So I did the scratch audio because um, it was just fun. And Ryan and I being so close are just really kin kindred in the storytelling process. So it made sense that we would do it. So. I started doing it and it was like, I had bowls of different kinds of cereal and I'm just jamming them in my face, <laughs> trying to create the scratch tracks for all the chomp marks. And, <laughs> and I realized that I have a, a, I had a, a good voice for their sort of nonsensical ridiculousness, kind of like Chris Wedge and, Wedge and Scrat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone doesn't know the, our uh, original, one of our original founders of Blue Sky is the voice of Scrat in the, in the film. His name's Chris Wedge. He's like a legend in the industry and he just, squeaks and squawks. I don't even know if he still records it. He just like squeaks and squawks. Yeah, he has a library of squeaks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so after the pitch, um, which they loved, they ended up bringing us on and we worked with an agency for I think a year and then um, General Mills liked us so much that we just worked directly with them. So we built the narratives, um, figured out which bots wanted to be about what and kind of cultivated things in a really like nice direct way with them. Mm -hmm. But because they liked the characters that we had built, one of the things that came along with it was me kind of being part of the personality of the characters. Yeah. So they 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 kept me on as the the vocals for the for the for the crazy squares for Amazing. four years, I think. And even the spots that are on right now, they're I think they're even using some of my vocals for like the characters themselves. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's got to be so strange for you to like just be watching TV and all of a sudden your voice pops up. And <laughs> Actually, I've had friends say that the, they've heard the commercial come up in another room. Yeah. And like once you once you hear my because my real laugh is in their laugh, which is a little <laughs> bit weird. But once you hear it, you can't unhear it. So I'm right. sorry for all those people right. who know it. So I could talk war stories with you all day about <laughs> the projects over the years. Um, and if you guys have questions about anything from Matt's, go ahead and throw them. If you're on Zoom, throw them in the chat window. Uh, if you're on Facebook, go ahead and put them in the comments and we'll circle back at the end. But I want to talk with Matt about Octane. So for those that don't know, because I didn't introduce you this way, Matt is developing a Octane rendering workshop, uh, basically a lighting in, in Octane workshop for the Academy of Animated Art. Uh, we are close to finishing that up now. So I just wanted to talk to Octane with you a little bit, Matt. And yeah. just your... 
because I know for you, it's more than just like this render. It's a kind of a new way of working. So I just kind of like, what drew you to Octane and, 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 and all this and the new rendering software that we're seeing these days? You know, for a while, um, I was a real strong supporter of Maxwell. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not why my son is named Maxwell, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I liked the idea of being, um, I guess treating treating the building of materials and treating lighting with somewhat of a scientific method when it came to the construct and then driving the artistry by doing something with the images that you get out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I always, I never liked um, the way in Mental Ray, for example, you had to like sort of tweak shaders to get them to behave right with certain shadows and you had to fake a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, just the original way of doing subsurface scattering, for example, it was just lots of depth fakes and it never really felt um, honest to me. Mm-hmm. So I loved Maxwell because Maxwell gave me a really clean and honest way to get rendered imagery out that behaved the way it would if we were lighting on set, but I still felt creative about it. The only problem was that a render would typically go from an hour to a hundred hours. And over the years, I kept my ears open and kept on watching what was happening with all the GPU world and what renders were coming out and specifically the, the new path tracers that were coming out. So I started working with Octane in the very early stages. I mean, we even rendered, we had a job that we rendered and we actually had to use the standalone and do like little batch sequences through overnight for like two days to get the thing rendered. Um, and it was, it was really sort of rough in the early stages, but I saw something immediately with how, um, how clear their concepts of building materials, building lights and building scenes was. And as the GPU structure accelerated from the 1080s to the 2080s to where we are now with the RTX stuff, the, the time it took to get an image that was really pretty and allowed you to have sort of those um, happy accidents mm-hmm. while still being um, very clean and clear about what you're building mm-hmm. just kind of started becoming more organic and it felt more creative. And then when the, the, the last chunk of GPUs came out about a year ago when the RAM got enough that you could really kind of load complicated scenes on it, it just kind of like blew the lid off of what you could do. Mm-hmm. And I think if you look at the user groups now, you can see what new users are doing very quickly and what it offers you. I think the, the speed and just the way that path tracing and the concept of BRDFs um, it sort of recalibrates the way a CG artist can work is something that I think is really important. And it also unifies the packages. So you're not relearning everything every single time you open up a new piece of software. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really, really, really like. And I I can't say that Octane is the spearhead of that movement, but I will say that their implementation of it has been artistic and from a code standpoint, very true and very clear. That's great. So yeah. if you're somebody that's been used to not working in a GPU renderer, or like someone who's been working in Arnold or Mental Ray over the years or something along those lines, like what's the first thing that you notice? Like what's the major difference between I two? think I think our Arnold was pretty good, but I think Arnold kind of give, gave people the same shock where you load up a scene that was really complicated and all of a sudden in a minute you have something that you're looking at and you're able to work with it. Yeah. Um, I've got scenes now where I have 12 seconds before I have to actually see something that's a full frame. Mm-hmm. So for me, being able to go through and nitpick little things here and there to really sort of calibrate, um, that's, that's something that um, the, the, the user, if you have the right hardware and the right software, will notice right off the bat. Um, I, I think that if you're going to, you, even if you're in Arnold, for example, and you're working mm-hmm. in the non-GPU version and you switch over and you get new hardware and you turn the GPU on, I think you'll probably be pretty blown away by how different it is. Okay. Which is why I think it's sort of like a, it, the, the, the responsibility of the change comes in two pools. One, there's the software, and two, there's the optimization that's really been coming from the NVIDIA guys for a number of years. That Now that they've, they've, they've planted their seed, now this thing has grown into this massive beast and it's just going to take over the world. Yeah, so speaking of that, do you see a lot of companies using that? Or were you using that a lot on your projects at Charlex? Do you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we use it on just about everything. Um, we'd still use Maxwell for certain things. We'd still use Arnold for certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, if you can, if you can afford to, um, if you can afford to get uh, the the cards that have the RAM to fit the job, which in a professional setting works really well, um, you you can get a pretty substantial amount of information onto the cards. Mm-hmm. So that's that's something that I talk about in the class. That's one of the, 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 the sort of the hamstrings of um, of the GPU structure is that you're limited by the GPU RAM. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we'll see a terabyte on a card in the next couple of years, and then that'll answer all the questions for companies like Disney. But um, I, we've been using Octane. I had used Octane for just about every single job at, at my, the last couple of years at Charlex, and it was it was amazing. We, we had jobs that we would shoot something on Friday, finish modeling it that night, I'd work through the night, we'd um, do the edit on Saturday, we get all the compers in on Sunday, and then we deliver the spot and air it on Monday night. And that's a 30 second spot from concept to shot, to edit, to post and conform. And that's like, that's, that's something that I never would have thought would have happened in my career. That's insane. That's, yeah, that's insane. the same timeline. Yeah. That's crazy. But um, it's like the thing that it lets you play. It's like this, you get back into the sandbox without hurting your productivity. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, that's really, really great. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have a couple questions that I want to get to and, um, the first one, uh, I'll go for Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas asks, what do you think um, early, what do you, uh, what do you think early career artists struggle with the most and what should they focus on improving? You know, I think one of the things that I see a lot with people in the early stages of their careers, um, is trying to pack their portfolio with a lot of stuff that covers a broad spectrum. Um, but not really taking the time to realize that just like everybody says, it's, it's quality, not quantity. Mm -hmm. So find the thing that you don't mind staying up at until four o'clock in the morning doing and realize that you have an innate draw to that and then find a way to put that into a project. One of the things that I do when I'm trying to teach um, is give something that's a little bit of a, 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 a trail of breadcrumbs um, that helps somebody get to an end product. So if that's a certain type of image that you want to sort of um, recreate or you want to create a scene that has a certain feeling to it. You collect your reference, you figure out how to get to that end point, and then somewhere in the middle, you learn all these great things that you didn't even realize you were ready to learn. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that that's a big part of the process is limiting, limiting, not putting, not putting too many eggs in the basket <laughs> um, and making sure the eggs that you do put in are really true to what you want out of them. That's great. Um, okay, another question for you. So before the actual coronavirus hit, it was a must, like 90% of, of artists, especially even, except for special freelancers, had to be located in the same studio, as the same city as a studio for security reasons. As companies are adapting to everyone working from home, do you think that industries are gonna shift to having more and more remote artists? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, think, I, I know I, I was responsible for selecting and hiring a lot of people for freelance jobs at Charlex. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why it's nice to have people in the city is obviously there's little things that pop up the 11th hour, but then also you're kind of on the same time schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time that we would prefer to hire people who are in the same time zone in the same city so they can come in if there's an emergency, mm -hmm. that's preferential, but we've hired people all over the world. Um, there is a guy, Alejandro, who is in Colombia, who is just like the mad scientist of fluid sims. And we worked with him for years. Obviously, he's not going to come up to New York to do sims for us. Yeah. Uh, so this definitely opens the door up faster than I think it would have without it for yeah. remote work. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that there were a lot of companies that didn't need to push to get remote artists because they had a good setup going the way they were. Yeah. And I think that I, and I think that what's going on now is going to change pretty much everything about our day-to-day -day lives. And I think yeah. that's part of it. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that, like, as Matt was saying, as companies were forced into this, they're going to see some, we're going to see some positives and we're going to see some negatives come out of this. I think some yeah. companies are going to start to realize that, Hey, maybe they don't need to keep the overhead of this big giant office. Instead, we can just send boxes to people at their homes and they can, they can be productive that way. Yeah. Um, I also think that there are going to be some things that we realize that we have to be in person for at times, like that, that coming together every once in a while is a good, a good way to meet and collaborate. So I, I do think that we're going to shift to more of a uh, work from home, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to kind of wait and see on that one. We may have to do it. Who knows? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows where um, this is going to end up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, another question. Um, Let's see. Speaking of GPU versus CPU rendering, do you think it will be possible soon to combine the computing power from both at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the next big jump. Um, I know V-Ray has um, what's called an XPU mix in the latest build of um, V-Ray Next. RenderMan is working on one right now. They've they they um, debuted. Uh, I think their XPU in an early state at SIGGRAPH last year. Mm -hmm. So obviously, with the limitations of RAM that the GPUs have. Um, if you've got a scene that has, that needs a terabyte of Ram and you don't want to wait for the vendors to put that Ram on the cards, then you've got to figure out how to make it work. And I 
I think yeah. um, doing it selectively is smart, but there's a lot of code that is required to get the two to work together. They're very different from mm -hmm. a, a structural standpoint. That's great. Um, so one question I want to ask you, so you between Blue Sky and Charlix and all your industry experience, you've probably sat in on a lot of demo reel reviews, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, what do you look for in a demo reel? Like what, what really stands out to you that, that somebody who's just coming into the industry that never sees that end of it, that never sees behind the curtain of a review room, like what, do you, what are you looking for in a demo reel review? I, I think it's... Um... It's difficult to kind of put your finger on that thing that lets you know that an image is finished. Mm -hmm. But I think as an artist over the years, you develop uh, a finer sensibility for it, that there's those, there's those primary shots that have like that, that, that first pass of detail, and then you see that second pass of detail, and you see that third pass of detail. Mm -hmm. And it's that third pass of detail, it's the little minutia that really kind of brings the image home. Yeah. And I think for lighting and composite, compositing specifically, those are the levels of finish that I start to look for, which is why I say less is more because mm -hmm. the more you spend finishing the details and getting the, the image to really sing, the better off that image is gonna be. So I think um, that's one level of finish is one. And then I think um, finding a way to show that you can manage complexity just from a professional, a professional standpoint is important as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, it's going to be difficult for somebody on their own to get their hands on really complex assets. That's getting better now with things like Turbo Squid and Kitbash. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, showing that you can handle uh, a complicated setup and still make it look beautiful is another big check on my on my list. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's about aesthetics, and it's again it's about wrangling the technology. That's a really good point. Yeah, I didn't think about that. We just we just are current. Uh, lighting challenge right now is a is a pretty vast Blade Runner type city that we're yeah. having everyone do. So I, that was something I was thinking of too. It's like it's great to have these small character vignettes because I I love those. Like I love these like very intimate character vignettes. Mm -hmm. That's also good to demonstrate that complexity of a scene. Um, from like, is there anything that you see on a demo reel that makes you cringe? I know I'm putting you on the spot with these. Or is there anything that you're like, oh, I wish they wouldn't have done that, or like something? Um, that you would you would advise people to avoid. You know, I, I think I think inconsistency is a big one. Um, if you have like three decent shots and then you put something on there that just feels completely whack, like mm -hmm. you just, just wanted to get something on the reel to fill it out um, yeah. to make it fit with the music that you chose, and it's uh, a scene that you lit in a night, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't have that that level of finish to it. I think those tend to stick out like a sore thumb pretty pretty easily. Um, and I think it shows a general lack of confidence, which again is, is, is important. Um, I can't say that there's anything specifically that I have ever seen that I really can put my finger on and say, look, don't do that. That's bad. I think being disingenuous with your imagery is the, is the most important thing. And I think it's something that um, as, as artists, as people, you can kind of sense, sort of sense, sense it and feel it while you're looking at a reel. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, it's an esoteric, terrible answer for something that no. needs a direct answer. No, but. that's, that is a fantastic <laughs> answer. Cause I think what that means, because when I'm, when I'm working on something, I don't always, sometimes, um, I'm, you know, I'm a human being. So I think about how much time I spent on something or like the things that were going on in my life when I was creating that. And I know that some things are a struggle and I almost force those. I want to like really put those on my demo reel. And I think what you're saying is to have someone that you trust who can look at your reel and go, not that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not that. Yeah. Take that off. Definitely. Um, I think that's, that's where I would recommend for, for people is just for, I, and I can only speak personally is that I've had some uh, great friends who have stopped me from making some terrible decisions <laughs> with my demo reel early on in my career. <laughs> like, Mike, I know you worked on that, but it's stupid and it's not going to be great and it's not going to look great. So, you know, that, that brings up another really good point. I think one of the, the best defenses to, to understanding what you're doing or not to understand what you're doing, but to, to have a bar to set yourself against mm -hmm. is to just be part of the community, rely on your friends, be, be there's a, there's a whole lot of really amazing artists out there and mm -hmm. most people are not terrible. So I think once you find yourself in the community, um, it just gets it just gets bigger and better. Yeah, totally. We are a very very supportive community here. And sorry, my Facebook messages are blowing up. There, let me just close that down. Um, <laughs> we had uh, yeah. Once you're in, and I think that 
and not to self promote, but the uh, Academy of Animated Art community that we build is is built on that. And I know that the critique style that Jasmine and I do is based on this idea of um, love through honesty. And I could say, like, even even when Jasmine and I work together, uh, we have a term because I had a, we we sh Matt knows for years and years and years we shared a desk we were side by side in, in our cubicles. And we had all this, we were trying to like decorate it one day. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if like we put up like these little balls of grass around? And she just looked at me and she was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> so now she, whenever I come up with a bad idea, she just calls it a balls of grass idea. And, and like, I'll, I'll, I'll say like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if like we made something that looked like this? And she was like, balls of grass, Mike, don't do it. <laughs> it's like having that in your life, having that like friend or coworker or like support member. Um, and that's what we try and do. Uh, in our communities, like we try to provide that support for people of yeah. honest, thorough feedback of them. So with that, I would like to say thank you so much, Matt, for joining us tonight. Thanks um, for having I, me. I don't know how to stop these without actually hanging up on you. So <laughs> Just slam like, the hammer down. Anyway, <laughs> as a friend uh, who I haven't seen in a few days, uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope your family is doing well. Uh, I love you so much, man. And I thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks so much, Mike. It's yeah, good to see you, I don't know if you guys know, but Matt and I have kids about a week apart in age. Yeah. So struggling with that at home. And uh, yeah, so we're doing great. So Matt, thank you again so much. And I will talk to you very soon. Thanks a lot, Mike. Talk to you later. Hey, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.